The morning of March 4th, 1908, seemed like any other morning in Collinwood, Ohio. Parents woke up, got their kids ready for school, and sent them off for their day. It was a chilly Ash Wednesday, with snow in the area, and everyone was looking forward to the coming spring. But what the parents sending their children to the Lakeview Elementary School didn't know is that for many, it would be the last time that they would be able to hold the, their children in their arms. Join me in this episode of Ohio Legends and Tales as we discuss the Collinwood School Fire. Welcome back to the Least Professional channel on YouTube, and welcome to Ohio Legends and Tales. This episode has been the most difficult for me to put together for the entire series. I'm going to be sharing the overall story, but also some excerpts from the Cincinnati Inquirer from the day after the event. Some of these excerpts may be rough, but they're necessary to properly tell the story. I'll mark the chapters in the progress bar of the video, and if at any point you need to skip over anything, I completely understand. With that being said, let's go ahead and get started. Lakeview Elementary School was a small school near the shore of Lake Erie in a small town known as Collinwood, Ohio. Collinwood was a small town home to about 8,000 people. It was a place where everyone knew everyone and the neighbors looked out for each other. Though small, the town was a diverse collection of people from many backgrounds, mainly due to the railroad industry that was prominent in the area. According to one of my sources, by 1899, Collinwood had its own school system, a newspaper, six churches, plentiful businesses, and even an amusement park. Over 300 children attended Lakeview Elementary School, which stood four stories tall and housed nine classrooms. The school day began every day at 8.45 a.m. March 4, 1908 started off as any other day for the students. Parents would get them up and ready for school. Some were more ready for the school day than others. Mothers and fathers would watch their kids head out for a day of learning, not knowing that this day would soon become a nightmare. The children arrived at school, filling the classrooms to start the day. At around 9.30 a.m., about 45 minutes after classes began, a fifth grade student named Emma Niebert noticed smoke rising from a storage closet in the basement. She would inform the janitor, Mr. Fritz Herter, and he would rush to sound the fire alarm. Sitting in their classrooms, many of the students were no doubt focusing on what they were being taught, or maybe thinking about what they would do once the school day was over. When the fire alarm rang, Many assumed it was another drill and began moving towards the classroom doors to exit the building as they had trained to do many times before. As they entered the hallways though, it became apparent that this wasn't a drill. The kindergartners of Miss Ethel Rose's class would be the only ones to make it through the front door of the schoolhouse before it would become impassable due to flames. Upon realizing that they could not escape the building through the front exit, students began to panic and rush toward the rear exit of the school. In the chaos, students would trip over one another as they tried to escape. Children who had been rushing for the front exits found themselves trapped in the hallway between a mess of their classmates coming down the main stairs and the flames which were quickly growing. Students heading toward the rear exit found the small doorway leading out of the school was blocked by other children who had become stuck in an attempt to make it out the door at the same time. Above them, on the higher floors, Miss Laura Bodie led her fifth grade class down the hallway to the stairs that would take them to the first floor. When she realized that there was no way to escape through the first floor exits, she walked her students back to the main fire escape. She was able to break the glass of a window and get most of her students out to safety. Some students on the higher floors attempted to escape in a similar manner, but not all would be successful and several students would perish after jumping out of the windows. By this time, word of the fire had already spread through the town and everyone had either made their way to the school or were on their way. The fire department had been summoned and were also making their way to the scene. Many parents would arrive only to find that their children were trapped inside the building with no way out. The Cincinnati Inquirer from March 5, 1908 recounts several tales of parents desperately trying to save their children. One such story, speaking of a father named Wallace Upton, reads as follows. Just in front of Upton's eyes was his own 10-year-old daughter. 
helpless in the crush, badly burned and trampled upon, but still alive. The fire was close upon her, and if she could not be saved at once, she could not be saved at all. Upton sprang to help her, and with all of his strength sought to tear her from the weight that was pressing down on her and from the flames which were creeping close. Although he worked with desperation, his strength was unequal to the task. He fought until his clothing was partly burned from him and the skin on his face and hands were scorched. Other men attempted to induce him to move, but he refused until he saw that his girl was dead and that he could not save her life by sacrificing his own. He then withdrew from the schoolhouse and, although so seriously injured that he may die, lingered about the place for several hours, refusing to go to the hospital or seek medical attention. This was just one of many stories involving parents desperately trying to save their children from the blaze and watching in horror with no way to do anything to rescue them. One of the students, Marie Whitman, was credited with braving the fire to save her little brother and was able to get him and herself out through a window with smoke nearly choking them before they escaped. One of the teachers, Miss Colmar, recounted a heartbreaking story of the children that she could not save. It was awful. I can see the wee things in my room holding out their tiny arms and crying for me to help them. Their voices are ringing in my ears yet and I shall never forget them. When the alarm rang, I started the pupils to marching from the building. When we started down the front stairs, we were met by a solid wall of flames and clouds of dense smoke. We retreated and when we turned, the children became panic-stricken and I could not do anything with them. They became jammed in the narrow stairway and I knew that the only thing for me to do was to get around to the rear door, I suppose, and help those who were near the rear entrance. When I got there, after climbing out of a window, I found the children so crowded in the, in the narrow passageway that I could not even pull one of them out. Those behind pushed forward, and as I stood there, the little ones piled on one another. Those who could stretched out their arms to me and cried for me to help them. I tried with all of my might to pull them out and stayed there until the flames drove me away. The fire raged on, burning the cross supports of the building until they were unable to support the weight from the floors above. Without warning, the building collapsed and all who were still trapped inside would perish. Initial reports estimated between 160 and 170 children had lost their lives. But in the end, the total would be 172 students and two teachers. More than half of the families in the town lost at least one child in the tragedy. The railroad company opened a nearby building as a makeshift morgue, and volunteers worked for hours to sift through the rubble and recover bodies. Grieving parents would filter in throughout the day and night to try to identify their children, many needing to be identified by trinkets they wore as they were burned beyond recognition. 19 bodies were unable to be identified and had to be buried in a mass grave in Lakeview Cemetery in nearby Cleveland. In the aftermath of the fire, the grieving community looked for who to blame. A coroner's inquest was held to determine the cause of the fire, but no one cause could be established. Many people placed the blame on the janitor, Fritz Herder, who they suspected had been in the basement when the fire started and had somehow caused it. The official cause would be labeled as an overheated steam pipe coming in contact with a dry joist. But Mr. Herder would argue against this being the cause stating that the furnaces were running low that day because it was unusually warm. This is in dispute as the reported temperature on the day was around the freezing mark. Mr. Herter also reported that he was on his way to turn up the furnace when he met the three girls that had reported the fire. But those three girls reportedly perished in the fire, which seems odd since they would have been the first to see it. He would seek out police protection due to anger from the community. But that anger would subside when people realized that he lost three of his own children in a fire that day. 
Initial reports stated that the main cause for the loss of life was that the doors to the school building opened inward instead of outward. This would be shown to be incorrect as the investigation unfolded. During fire drills, students had been trained to head for the main exit of the school, which would be the exit that was blocked by fire on March 4th. The rear door of the school was only a little over 5 feet wide with both doors open, but it would become even narrower when one of the doors closed as the students were trying to escape, causing them to try and fit through a much smaller area and subsequently clog up the opening easier. There was also one fire escape available, but it didn't go all the way to the ground, and many children were too afraid to make the six-foot jump needed to escape. The town fire department turned out to be another major issue. As a smaller town, Collinwood had 20 volunteer firefighters and very basic equipment. Their ladders were not tall enough or sturdy enough to rescue the children from the higher floors. From the time the fire started, it took 20 minutes for the fire department to arrive on scene. Someone had to run nearly a mile from the school to the fire department and ring the alarm bell to summon the volunteers who were able to get to the station, get horses hitched up, and get to the school. The horses they used needed to be borrowed as the horses owned by the fire department were being used on the other side of town to clear snow and ice. In the days, weeks, and years that followed the disaster, it would be used as an example to promote fire safety in schools. Most of the change would take years and even decades as many schools considered themselves already sufficient. Within days of the tragedy, the Ohio Congress had passed a bill that was signed by the governor that set aside $25,000, equivalent to about $750,000 in today's money, to create a committee of three residents of Collinwood, known as the Collinwood School Fire Relief Commission, to examine the list of victims and pay them up to $100, equivalent to about $300 today, per child lost or injured in the fire. Though this would never make whole the families of the victims, it would help to cover the cost to lay the victims of the horrific tragedy to rest. As a parent myself, I can't fathom the pain that these families went through. Within the span of only a few hours, parents lost their children, a community had its heart ripped out, and the future would change for the entire country. The changes made to the school fire safety regulations following this disaster have potentially saved hundreds or possibly even thousands of students but we can never know the full impact. How many disasters were averted because 172 students lost their lives on March 4, 1908? The main lesson I took away from this story is to hold your loved ones close and treat every day like it could be the last time that you see them. I want to thank you all for watching this episode of Ohio Legends and Tales. Like I said before, this was one of the harder ones to research just because of the subject matter involved. If you enjoyed the video, hit the thumbs up button to help YouTube know to show it to more people. And subscribe if you aren't already so you don't miss out on any more Ohio Legends and Tales videos, as well as all of the fun videos I upload each and every week. Click on the playlist on the screen now to catch up on any Ohio Legends and Tales videos you may have missed. As always, everyone have a great rest of your day, and I'll see you in the next one.